We all here believe that every fossil is a story told by Earth. From this, can you imagine how far in time fossils enable us to travel? Are they recording years, days, hours? And as paleontologists, what kind of information can we gain from that? Welcome to my presentation, everyone. My name is Najat al fadeli a second semester paleobiology master student, and I'm excited to talk about my research on rudas. But first, what are rudists? They are sessile epifaunal bivalves that appeared in the late Jurassic and flourished throughout the Cretaceous period, occupying shallow tropical environments, and their dominance within tropical regions is presumed to hinder the growth of other immobile organisms during the Cretaceous period, like the zooxanthellate corals. But why rudists? because the way they developed enabled them to store their life history marked by growth increments within their shells. The accretion of these increments allows reconstruction of environmental and physiological conditions. In rudus, the shell is secreted with a rhythmic pattern of both tidal and daily increments, synchronized with the surrounding environment conditions like ambient water energy and depth as well as the temperature. But because these are rudest and they have always something unique to show, light also matters in their growth. And beside the ecological factors, photosymbionts have played an important role in some rudest shell precipitation and morphology, which would be reflected in their chemical composition. I'm trying to solve three main questions through this study. First, how fast can rudists precipitate their shell layers? Second, is the presence or the absence of photosymbionts affecting that? Third, are all kinds of rudist species actually symbiont-bearing bivalves? So, I'm aiming to test their shell's individual growth rate, verify eventual photosymbiosis in rudists by checking the linearly correlated oxygen and carbon stable isotopes, and finally, I'm trying to establish comparison between the growth rates with respect to the presence or the absence of symbiotic interaction and using non-symbiotic bivalve as a control group. Here, I briefly show the flow of the applied methods in our work, starting with the increment analysis, followed by the shell preservation and composition investigation, and finally, the measurements of stable oxygen and carbon isotopes. The external banding of the rudest shells indicate a biological growth rhythm that is assumed to be of annual origin, but they are also showing finer growth increments within the presumably annual major bands. They are of unknown chronological hierarchy in some species and may reflect a temporal change in the environment, like seasonal changes which affect the salinity and temperature, lunar cycle, and tidal fluctuations. Counting and measuring the width of these fine increments gives information about their time of formation and growth rate and may also reveal the duration of the growing season. For this, we use the petrographic thin sections and the fluorescence microscopy images. Here, we can see the four studied bivalve species of the three rudas and one oyster, and the corresponding thin sections below. Keeping in mind that each external band is reflecting one year, we assume the following ages for each specimen. Then, we move to counting and measuring the internal increments along the marked red transect in each specimen. Now, as I have mentioned earlier, these fine increments are of unknown origin in some species, as can be observed in this example. I tried to assess the matches of the counted internal lines with the outer major bands, as it's marked by the dashed lines in the two images and the graph below. Now, these beautiful fine increments of the honeycomb structure shown in the upper right image are not clear if they are representing an architecture unit in the shell or if they are of chronological rhythm. And what we can notice also from the graph below is that through the early stage, the organism is not growing as fast as it's shown in the later stages, where it tends to show a periodic pattern of increase in the increment width followed by a decrease. 
The assumption of the daily secreted increment would be feasible in right essentially. The massive number of the included increments within this specimen is noticeably beating the other three species. Also, bearing in mind the number of the days during the Cretaceous would highly support that. And what we can clearly see here is that the growth rate was steady in the specimen, revealing an average width of 29.5 micrometer and showing no cyclicity. Now, to confirm the raised assumption of both the annual major bands or to have an idea about the origin of the fine increments, measurement of stable carbon and oxygen isotopes have been acquired. But prior to that, shell composition and preservation have been checked. Let's take this specimen as an example and have a close look at these fine increments. We can see here that the thin section image shows the beautifully fine bended increments along with high interfered colored rings. Their mineralogical composition and distribution within the shell have been checked by SEM images, EDX, and Raman spectroscopy. This shows that these are very small silica crystals were very localized in their distribution and can be avoided during the isotope sampling. Now we can move to the isotopes result. Starting with the Megagillaria species, through band number 10, 10 samples have been measured. The record of the stable oxygen isotope shows periodicity in what is most likely a seasonal scale. Next, we look at the Vexenites specimen where 28 samples were drilled along the fourth and the lower bordered fifth band. An annual cycle was investigated with the stable oxygen ratios that range between minus 3 and minus 3.5 per mil. Now, the obtained values have been compared to the results from some earlier studies as shown here, for example, by Stoiber on the same material. In Turati synthesis, the difference between oxygen ratios is 2.7 per mil, resulting in temperature amplitude of 10.8 degrees Celsius. But surprisingly, the expected one-year cycle cannot be tracked through the sample 430 fine bands. And here, from the sample synchronized internal lines within band 6 and the beginning of the border 2 bands, the annual cyclic behavior was not strong as shown by the obtained record of the stable oxygen isotope in this oyster specimen. You may notice the correlation between the records of the oxygen and the carbon stable isotopes in some species. I was surprised when I saw that at first because this is less likely to be a diagenetic alteration indicator because the shell preservation has been well checked and depending on that, the sampling strategies have been decided. Luckily, in the right moment, this paper was published attributing such correlation to the presence of photosymbiotic relationship between rudus and dinoflagellates. So eventually, I tested that on the three rudest species, and I used the oyster as non-symbiotic control group. The test was valid through two rudest species, and data were compared with the winter ETL results. Now, I can say that symbiote-bearing bivalves tend to grow faster than the non-symbiotic ones in the same environmental conditions as it's shown here by Turitis synchesi and the Megaglavia compared to the Vexenitis species and the oyster. And it seemed to be the case during the Cretaceous. So, I would conclude my talk by raising the assumption that the high efficiency of photosymbionts rudus promotes their success in expanding within the tropical regions and assist by their shell morphological features, they embed the growth of coral communities. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for your attention.